Welcome back to the Cross Border Interview Podcast. I'm your host, as always, Christopher Brown. Today's guest was the elected official for Calgary Hawkwood from 2015 to 2019. He was one of the first openly LGBT members elected to the Alberta legislature, Michael Connolly. Michael Connolly and I sit down and we talk about a range of issues, including his sense of duty, why he chose to run, and what it meant for him to be one of the first openly LGBT members elected in Alberta, and his sense of being a role model to younger generations. So sit back, relax, and enjoy Cross Border Interviews featuring Michael Connolly. I guess that's the perfect spot to start. Sure. <laughs> um, where did your sense of duty come from? Where did your sense of ability to put your name forward and run for office? That was quick. Um, <laughs> I always That's the first question I ask all former politicians, politicians, everything. That's fair. What about the country singers? Do they have to answer the question? Oh, yeah. Where does your country music duty come from? <laughs> hey, for somebody who said it doesn't listen to my podcast, you know there was country music. So. Well, I, I, well, I follow you on Instagram. <laughs> That's true. That's close enough. <laughs> so where does your sense of duty come from? Sense of duty. Robin! Everywhere. Come here. Shoot. Come here. Um, good question. Where does... <laughs> Did it oh, come to your know. parents? Uh, I guess to a degree. Like, my mom was a teacher. So, uh, obviously, in the 90s, when uh, Ralph Klein was uh, cutting left, right, and center, that really got me interested in politics and, like, why these things were happening and how we can do things differently. And then, uh, as I progressed and saw what the... Uh, what happened from those cuts uh, like in my high school if everyone showed up to my English class people had to sit on the floor because they didn't have enough seats Wow! and that was because of the cuts from Ralph Klein and from uh, subsequent uh, PC administration so that's really what got me interested and got me more active in politics and then my first election that I volunteered on was the 2012 provincial election I knocked doors for uh, Mark Power in Calgary Klein uh, and then I moved to Ottawa and I started working in Parliament Hill and I saw uh, more politicians there and met MPs and uh, believed that if they could do that, and I could because, you know, you don't always have the best MPs. Uh, so I decided to put my name forward as a federal NDP candidate in Calgary, Minnapur. And because then, you were going to do that in the 2015 federal election, yeah. correct? And then they asked me to run provincially. And at that time... Uh, Alberta being a very solidly blue province, did you think you had a chance in hell to win? Provincially, I believe I knew I knew there was a small chance. Oh, federally, I knew there was a small chance, but provincially, I believe there was a better chance, <laughs> better chance a too. better small chance. Uh, so, yeah, uh, so that I, I did want to run provincially, but I, did, I wasn't going to be back in time. Because I was still in school. Uh, so they asked me in January. I told them, probably not, but uh, keep me in mind if you just need somebody on the ballot. Uh, and then I ended up coming at, back late March and sent an email saying, hey, if you still need a candidate, I can do that. Uh, and then a couple weeks later, like, hey, we need a candidate. We need you to fill out these papers. And We need a candidate for yeah. Hawkwood. Yeah. Which, did you know Hawkwood at that time? No, like I grew up in Bonavista, Vista, so I was in the southeast and Hawkwood is in the northwest. But it's very similar to where I grew up, like very uh, middle class upper middle class sometimes uh, very similar to uh, schools to my high school yeah so it was very easy to get into Hawkwood and the northwest even though I grew up in the southeast because you were taking on an incumbent who had been elected a few times just once just, just once yeah and, and he's, now he's a minister well an associate minister let's not <laughs> let's not be <laughs> let's not be too crazy <laughs> exactly he's a terrible minister but like he's still an associate minister so uh, that election you put your name for uh, the party says, okay, we need someone in Hawkwood. We'll put you on that ballot. You're sort of a name, in name only uh, candidate by the sounds of it. Did you canvas in that writing? I did some Lisa drops on my, because I was working as a poll cat uh, in Calgary Varsity because uh, I needed a job. So making 15 bucks an hour as a poll cat. And then on my time off, I would go to my own writing and put up generic NDP signs. I'd do some leaflet dropping. 
but nothing major. I just I didn't have the time. I didn't have a team. It was just me. So what what time did it hit you that this could actually be a thing where you could be elected? Well, when I got went to pick up the signs the first time, uh, Scott Payne, who was working at our provincial office, said, "Hey, like there's a lot of movement in Hawkwood. You could actually win this." And I was, I was like, "Nah, that's not going to happen." And I was like, "That's no, so obviously it was my, in the back of my mind at that point." And then like as time progressed, it was like this is a different election, and like I could actually win, but you keep it out of your mind because you don't want to get your, didn't want to get my hopes up. And like, well, if I only did this, then I would have won. Uh, but uh, yeah, so then election day, I was uh, inside scrutineering, uh, and so eight o'clock the polls close, uh, eight thirty they declare NDP government, and, and then we're like, oh, we should maybe start going. Like this is we are like, oh, it's probably not true. And then at eight forty-five they declare NDP majority government, and then we're like, all right, we have to go to the victory party. I think we're done here. So yeah, and then and then they called your writing. Yeah, eventually. And what was the moment, that moment, like, holy crap, I wasn't prepared for this? Or was it, holy crap, I'm about to, my whole life is about to change here? A little bit of, uh, more like the latter. <laughs> I probably, I definitely wasn't prepared, but like, it's very, I don't know, it's, it's different. It was, uh, like, Ricardo was there, and uh, he was concentrating on his writing, and we had met once, and I knew Deborah because I had worked with her sister in Ottawa, uh, but for the most part, and I was working on Stephen McQueen's campaign, so I knew uh, Karen McPherson and Jamie Klein Stuber because they also worked on that campaign. Uh, but like, yeah, it was it's it was an odd moment. I remember I got there and I was standing at a table watching a screen, and somebody came up to me and was like, "Oh, campaign work on my Oh, I'm actually a candidate." He's like, "Have they called you writing yet?" And I was like, "No." He's like, "I need to get you a drink because you you seem like you need a drink. You should you should get a drink." And then, yeah, so that that night I. I didn't have very much to drink because uh, it was like it was shocking. So I remember we had that party, and then I, we had a short, small after party afterwards. And I probably I drove a bunch of people home because I wasn't really drinking. Uh, and uh, I got home probably at four a.m. And then I woke up at six a.m. because I like everyone. Like he, I was talking to a couple people. I thought I was talking to a class a couple of weeks ago in, at Carleton University. And uh, like there's just this like sense of duty, and you have all this energy because you just won. But everyone else is exhausted. Everyone yeah. who worked for the campaign is exhausted and trying to like recoup the energy, but they have to start transition and it's exhausting for them. It's exhausting for us, but we're just pumped and we need to do something. So when did it hit you that you were one of the first three openly LGBT members elected to an Alberta legislature? Well, as soon as we won, Mark Power, who I yeah. was campaigning for in 2012, came up to me. He's like, yes, he's also LGBTQ. He's like, you just became the first openly LGBTQ member. LA elected and at the, at the time like we didn't we didn't know that Estefania had won, uh, was going to win and, and I had never met Estefania and uh, we didn't know that Ricardo Ricardo, Ricardo hadn't been uh, announced yet so it, that was that was the moment I was like oh well, that's interesting <laughs> and there's not that much you can do but like in the we, we got like two sentences we all stood in a row all the candidates from Calgary and area and uh, like my speech was I want to thank uh, the member something like this I want to thank Everyone, the constituents of Calgary Hawker for giving me this uh, power, well, power for giving me this opportunity, uh, and I want to thank them for electing one of the first LGBTQ politicians in Alberta's history. Well, MLAs, and something like that. The, 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 I guess the question has to be asked: Do you consider yourself a gay Canadian or Canadian who happens to be gay? <laughs> <laughs> Is there a real difference? Yes, I think so. What do you think the difference is? I think the difference is a uh, gay Canadian is someone who is an activist who goes out there and campaigns, who uh, talks openly about it, and a Canadian who happens to be gay might be on the back burner. It might be, I'm a Canadian first, and you know what? My sexual orientation doesn't matter. And I, I consider myself the latter. I consider myself a Canadian first and then a member of the LGBT community second, because I, I'm not the one who's going out to the uh, rallies or the campaigns or the pride parades and canvassing and knocking on doors I'm just the one saying okay yeah. I, I, I like the company of men yeah. so what would you consider yourself? Probably the former Really? Yeah I, I really uh, especially like I, I try to do a lot of international work with the LGBT community and just across uh, provincial lines and things like that and I think it's really important for LGBTQ politicians especially to have that uh 
have the, that support. And to, and uh, for me, it was important that people know that I was gay and that I was supporting the community and that I was doing everything I could to support the community because we'd never had that opportunity before. We'd never had openly LGBTQ MLAs before in Alberta. So I personally, for myself, it was really important to show that this is something that can happen and we are represented in the legislature and we deserve to be represented in the legislature. And at that time, there wasn't that many openly LGBT MPPs or MLAs across Canada. There was Kathleen Wynne, the Premier of Ontario at that yeah. time, and also Wade McLaughlin, the Premier of PEI. Yeah. So adding those three voices in Alberta, a uh, traditionally solidly blue uh, mm-hmm. province, did that make it a little bit more... Uh, uh, what's the word I want to use here? More... Uh, urgent to stand up and say that to because looking back on some of the speeches that you've made uh, in your time in office and during uh, some of the bills that you introduced uh, they would uh, I would say that they were more pro LGBT than the last 44 years that we've had in this province mm-hmm. so was that something that was top of mind when you were going into the legislature or was that something you went you know what I don't see that representation I need to make sure if I leave this place there will be representation or there will be safeguards in place that uh, a young kid who's struggling with their identity can uh, see me and see what I've done to make them feel more comfortable in their skin. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All of those things. Like, uh, I, I was lucky, like, having worked in Ottawa before, I knew people like Craig Scott, who was an openly gay MP. I knew Randall Garrison, uh, and I've met Sherry Benson and other NDP uh, MPs. Also, Sven Robinson and Libby Davies, uh, who were the first two openly LGBTQ people in Parliament. And so, it, I, I, after I won, I, I called uh, Craig Scott and asked him like wh- wh- how do you balance the those out and like the needs of your constituents versus the need of your uh, community and talking to those sets of people and I was lucky that I got to go to a few conferences uh, uh, surrounding the LGBT community and I got to speak in Portland and San Diego about the work that we were doing here and what it was like to be an openly gay uh, politician in uh, traditionally conservative places. And Did you get attacked? Uh, Did you get, like, uh, when you look at the social media today, it's very, uh, we, uh, especially, well, especially for some of your uh, female cabinet ministers during your time in office, uh, there was a very bad uh reaction to some of them. Did you ever feel that when you were uh, elected that they were coming after you because you were gay? Yeah, sometimes they did. Really? Yeah. So how did you deal with that? Because uh, for people who might not be able to deal with that on the way that you were able to deal with it, how were you able to deal with it to make it not so... uh uh, prominent in your life. I uh, have a therapist, <laughs> and that's always helpful. Really? Uh, well, yeah. Uh, I think most so you, most politicians should have a therapist. <laughs> okay. Were you able to rely on all your caucus colleagues? Yeah, uh, uh, especially uh, like Ricardo and Estefania, uh, and uh, like I obviously I'm quite lucky being a white uh, white guy, uh, and just being young and gay being the minority parts. Uh, but uh, so I did get attacked in certain certain respects. Uh, sometimes uh, I said things that I probably shouldn't have said on Twitter and things like that. And then I got attacked for that. And then the way to attack me was always to attack my sexuality and uh, my party and my age. So I probably got attacked more for my age than I did for my sexuality. Like I remember there was one professor who at the University of Calgary. I don't, actually, I don't think they were a professor. I think they were an administrative worker who would send me send me a couple emails and just like attack me for a, for my age, saying, "Oh, well, you probably just don't know enough and you're too young and things like that." But uh, can you help me with this? And it's like, no, I'm not going to help you. You just re- insulted me several times in this email. So no, I'm not going to respond to you because why would I respond to somebody who thinks so lowly of me? Uh, and that really, so I just, and like, it was a decision for me to do that. Like if you're, go, I, I don't even, I don't know if we responded or not. I think I might have responded once, but like if I would suggest to anyone, if they want an MLA or an MP or any politician to help them to not insult them in the very beginning of an email, 
uh, it's it's ridiculous and uh, it's not going to help anything. And if you really want to have a back and forth conversation with them, uh, try to go in with an open mind instead of just assuming that they don't know anything or that they're stupid or they just don't have any life experience because chances are they do have different life experience than you do. Okay, so uh, the GSA bill that was introduced, mm -hmm. um, the opposition at that time seemed to not agree full heartedly on that. No. Um, when you were uh, helping, I'm assuming you helped because uh, they probably looked for input from all members and all uh, people from backgrounds who would be affected by this. Right. Did you have anything to fall back on? Like when you were in high school, did you have a GSA? I think there was one set up, but I never went. Why not? Uh, were you out in high school? I was, but I didn't want to be gay. <laughs> Okay. Like, I didn't want to be labeled as gay, you know? Like, I was, like, gay, but also kind of homophobic in that way. Like, I didn't... I wanted to be gay, I wanted to be open, but I didn't want people to think that I was... Just the gay guy who... Yeah, or, like, to be blunt, like, a faggot. Like, yeah. Yeah. Or a fruit. Like, that type of thing. No, understandable. And... Ooh, so when that was coming forward, did you have to uh, uh, sort of resolve those issues that you were go uh, going through in high school because you were like, okay, I was going through this in high school. Is everyone else going to be going through the same thing in high school? Or did you say, you know what? I was stupid in high school. I shouldn't have thought that way. I should have I should have been able to reach out to the GSAs and go to them. Or did you just say, you know what? We need them now because I see what the opposition is putting forward and it's going to hurt anyone who could be coming out. Yeah, well, we needed it then and we needed it now. Like, I remember when we put a, not we, but when the GSA tried to put up posters, there's probably like three people in it. Like, people would just write faggot or write them all down, things like that. And I I was not happy about that, uh, but I didn't do that much to change it. Uh, and I feel like I could have joined or something like that. Uh, but uh, so that, I, I, I wish I had done more in high school to have helped out with that and maybe would have helped other people come out at the time. Uh, but there's only so much you can do for the past. So uh, what I tried to do is make sure that uh, if uh, like students in Alberta wanted to have access to a GSC, that they had access to a GSC because there are a, lot, are a lot more people. And it's changed a lot even since I was in high school of how people view sexual orientation, how people view um, sexuality and uh, gender and things like that. So I was really happy to be able to do what I to do what small part I could to help push that and to hopefully make things better and make people uh, help students believe that there are people out there who are fighting for them and who, who look like them and who know what they're going through because like I was in high school during this decade seemed to not be this decade but you know I was <laughs> did you uh, no did you talk to kids yeah, when, I went to... When, but not even be, before the whole GSA. When you went to schools, because I'm assuming as an MLA, you went to schools, you talked to student groups. Yeah. Um, did you hear from kids who were struggling with their identity and said, thank you for being so openly out because it helps me and I'm going to go tell my parents? Or did you not hear that? I did hear that, not the latter, not the last part where they're going to go tell their parents because I didn't know if they were out or not and I wasn't going to ask. <laughs> yeah. But yeah, it, I, I, whenever I went to a school, whether that be a junior high or high school, I would try to to, I think sixth grade class too. I tried to tell them that I was one of the first openly gay MLAs, that I was the one of the youngest people and the youngest person ever elected in Calgary. I think, yeah, not just the provincially, but I think all around. I believe so. If somebody wants to correct me, they can. <laughs> hey, they can. Until then, <laughs> until then, I'm going to gloat. Exactly. Uh, so, but, was yeah. there a pride in that? That you know what people are looking at me, uh, young kids are looking up to me now. I I, I would hope so. And like I, I want, I wanted people to look up to me and see me and believe that they can accomplish uh, uh, whatever they wish and that they can be uh, open and happy and be who they are and accomplish their goals. During this time, you, you have four years to accomplish as much as you possibly can because elections come and go and you never know if you're going to get reelected. Looking back on your time, is there more that you could have done? Probably. Like what? Oh, I don't know. <laughs> 
But I'm sure there is more that I could do. There's always more you can do, but uh, there's, there's, I don't think that there's really a point uh, to... Uh, that to was just, me, you, just FYI. It was not him. <laughs> doesn't matter. Uh, I still have a beer. Uh, but like, there's, there's always more that can be done. But thinking about, it, oh, well, I should have done this, I should have done that, that's not going to help anything in the future. It's better to think about what you can do in the future to make those things better. And if I were to run for office again, then I have things that I can help with. Uh, I'm sure that there's other things that we can accomplish to make things better for the LGBTQ community, but there's not, there's nothing I can do about the past. So you were uh, pretty active, and my husband was, was too, and Estefan, Estefania was as well, uh, of going to rural pride parades, rural pride celebrations. Uh, was that a, a goal that you set out for yourself, or the three of you put together that, Lulu, come here, Lulu! <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> was it a goal that you three set out or was it a goal that uh, the party set out to say, you know what, we need to outreach to let people know that we're here for everyone, even in the rural ridings? Because the three of you were elected in Edmonton and two in Calgary. So were you able to outreach or were you the ones making that decision to go outreach to the rural areas? Yeah, I think it was us. I could be wrong. Ricardo can correct me. Um, Ricardo but, could always correct you because he just walked in and he's trying to not say anything right now. Hi, what? honey. Hello. I, I think it was more of a personal decision. And I think we worked together to try to figure out what prides we wanted to go to mm-hmm. and how we were going to divide it. And then we tried We were. We tried ourselves to get caucus to get more involved into all these prides. Uh, and they a lot of times they were very willing to help us out. They were trying to help us out to, with travel and things like that. Like I think the first year we went to Medicine Hat Pride together. Uh, I remember I went to the first Tabor Pride, uh, Lethbridge Pride. Uh, I never made it to Central Alberta Pride, uh, Jasper Pride. I think those were the ones other than Calgary and Edmonton that we were usually able to get to. Able to get to on a yeah. regular basis. And then, like, there's I, don't, I never made it to Peace River Pride uh, or Fort McMurray Pride. But I think either Ricardo or Stefania made it to one of those or both. Did you guys ever make it? No. Not Ricardo. So other people, maybe. <laughs> but, uh, yeah, so it was a lot of us, and, like, we were working with our MLAs in there. Oh, Banff Pride, that was one we always went to, because that was always a lot of fun. And always very close, and, like, a nice hotel room, and, like, of you course. know, it's great. And it's a... Yeah, I love, yeah, I love Banff. But never, who doesn't? Uh, you don't love Banff? Expensive. <laughs> well, yeah, it's expensive. <laughs> exactly. But, like, do you love... Like, I like... Uh, personally, I like Jasper more. But uh, that's I, I don't know. It's just like a little less commercialized. But I still love like hanging out in Banff and being with hanging out, being able to hang out with Ricardo and Stefania it was always a great time when we were either out dancing or whatever doing that. Yeah. Um, so you have four years in government, uh, then you make the decision not to run. Mm-hmm. Was that a challenging decision? Yeah, it was. It was always a challenging decision because you don't always just feel like you can not run. <laughs> Because you're, yeah, you're an incumbent, you're, yeah. you you want to try and do uh, more. Yeah. But there must be there must have been a little voice in the back of your head and said, you know what, I had my time, I need to go back and finish off my schooling or yeah. go back into a career. So uh, take me through that process if you can of when you decided you weren't going to run, when you announced it on social media, and uh, the process of sitting out an election where you probably saw a opposition leader who you vehemently despised. Yeah. Start coming after what you guys have done in the last four years. Yeah. Well, I didn't sit it out. <laughs> okay. I was working on I was working on a campaign the whole okay. time. Yeah. So I was a, I was a voter contact organizer in Calgary Elbow for uh, Janet Aramenko, who was our candidate there. And so I was really glad that I was still able to help, even if I wasn't a candidate. But yeah, uh, it's uh, it's it's a difficult decision not to run or to run. <laughs> Everything's difficult in politics. Because honestly, and I, I say this with all sincerity, and Ricardo would back me up on this. My father said after he met you, "Why the hell is that guy not running again? He would be the perfect MLA potential, the next leader." Oh, that's very nice. Of him. And that's my father. Like from like <laughs> ten years ago, when he was like, "If you're gay, don't tell me because I don't want to hear." Too. Yeah. Oh my God! I want to see this. He's not talking about me because that'd be too hard. <laughs> He's talking about this other guy. He's only met once and at a wedding that he wants you to go be the next leader of the party. So, well, it's very kind. 
but yeah, like I, I didn't uh, for a few. There's, there's a few reasons I didn't want to be a lifelong politician. For one thing, I wanted to, I want to be able to have another career or a few other careers or do something else before I continue on in politics. If I continue on in politics, uh, I really. Uh, uh, what else? <laughs> So it was, it's, it's difficult to, to uh, like be single uh, and be a politician for another thing. Uh, it always, your life is under a microscope. So being a gay person in this realm is also very difficult because of the uh, the how uh, the gay community is structured and uh, how we approach relationships in different ways or in similar ways. But it's never, you never always know what's going to happen. And it's very difficult to find a partner in that realm. Well, and you, you, you broke the subject. I wasn't going to, but I asked Ricardo this and I'll ask you as well. Um, was it hard dating while being in MLA? Because you're looking at the pe- person you might be going out on a date with as, are you dating me just because I'm another person or are you dating me to try and get opposition research or potentially get me to say something stupid and use it against me? Yeah, exactly. No, it's very difficult. Really? Because you th- you're always thinking about that in the back of your head like you're always thinking is this person just dating me because uh they want something from me or they think that i have clout or something like that or are they dating me because they genuinely like me and think i'm attractive and things like that so that's something you always have in the back of your mind it's always difficult and like i don't think i don't think it ever happened like there were some dates i didn't even have very many dates but it felt like there were some dates where maybe that was the case but no uh you never really know I feel like I'm very picky in general. <laughs> I've heard like that's stories. A problem. So about me being picky or not being picky? <laughs> Both. <laughs> he's gonna. <laughs> Ricardo's watching this as we record this, so he's, he's going to punch me, but <laughs> after this, so you decide to not run, and uh, you help out on Jan- Janet's uh, campaign in Calgary Elbow. Yeah. Uh, after the election, you decide to move east. Yeah. Most, you well, don't hear you don't hear that often, but mostly yeah. it's move west to find opportunity. Well, you decide, well Jason Kenny has been destroying our economy, <laughs> so I had to move east. There you go. Find jobs back where Doug Ford comes from. Right? Exactly. So, so uh, yeah. So uh, it, I only decided to move back to Ottawa. I was I was there for three years before, and then obviously I came back, and now I'm back there uh, because that's where I was, I was able to finish my degree. So I only have, if I finish at the University of Ottawa, I only have a year and a half, but if I go somewhere else, it'd be pretty, probably two years, two and a half years. So at least this way, it's the shortest amount of time possible. <laughs> I really like my professors, and like I'm really I'm really glad I went back because it is, a, I feel like I'm very intelligent and professors who are interested in similar things than I am, so that's really helpful to me. So what's the career path? Oh, I don't know. Really? Yeah, I'll figure it out. <laughs> right now, I'm going to finish my degree. And maybe degree I'll get a master's. In it's, in, it's in history and political science. So it's... And then, so, like, that coupled with, like, the four years of being an elected official, I feel, helps me out in the political or governmental world. But currently, I'm... Yeah, I, I just got a job uh, with a, at, at, in Ottawa, and so like that I can keep as long as I want, but I don't necessarily want to keep it forever. Uh, I, I, I'd rather do something else, at least for later. <laughs> but right now, it's fine. Do you feel like you want to come back here, or is, is home Ottawa now? Uh, no, home is still Calgary. Like, all my family's here. I have my niece here. My dog's here. Uh, my mom, dad, all family's here. Uh, I'm the only one who ever left. <laughs> so, so you're not 100 percent sure where you're going to end up. But no, uh, it depends if I find a partner somewhere. It depends uh, where I find a job. I, I would like to go to another country, maybe live there for a bit. But you know, I don't know. I have no plans because last time I tried to have plans, it didn't work out, and I got elected. And now I'm just like going with whatever works. So you uh, you mentioned it, but you said you potentially might run for office again. You're not sure if you would, but. Uh, it's you. You have brought it up a few times during this literally half hour conversation so far. Um, higher aspirations, same level or lower level, or school board, or like who knows? <laughs> really? <laughs> yeah, really. but you have the political edge still. I, yeah, I love t- politics. It's more interesting. Like again, I'm working in like a nine to five job, and it's very boring. Like it pays better, but it's boring. <laughs> I don't know if actually you know, it doesn't pay better. I'm working part time. It doesn't pay better. I was going to say, wow. Yeah. But eventually, like, it could, it would pay better because then it's like nine to five. So I usually have those days off. I get to go home. I don't have to think about work after five o'clock. I have the weekends off. So that's nice. But like, it's boring. 
but, <laughs> but, but, yet. <laughs> but it must ne- be nice now to have a personal life, right? Because, uh, like, even when I talk to Ricardo, talk to a few other of your former co- uh, colleagues, uh, balancing that work to personal life was the hardest task. Oh, yeah. So did you talk to your uh, uh, MA or... Exactly, you, I'm assuming you didn't have an MA. I didn't have an MA. No. I was a minister. <laughs> so like when, CA. What, yeah, your CA, did you say, okay, every Friday, I don't care what it is, I need to have off, or every Tuesday, I need to have off, to balance that? Because working 24 hours, which some yeah. politicians do, must have probably killed you. But. No. Uh, so I didn't have that. There's some, like, there's some points, I'm like, I need some time off. We have to cancel this thing tomorrow. Or... I really can't do this thing on Sunday. Can we move it to another day? But now having uh, that freedom now must be a lot easier. And well, now I don't have the money. That's the other problem. Yeah, but you, but you're looking at potentially going back into yeah. politics, and you go, okay, do I want to put myself through that again? Yeah, well, I don't want to do that right now. Okay. But oh, yeah. you, have to, you have a year and a half to finish off school, right? Yeah, exactly. Then I'll get right back into it. <laughs> exactly. Would you run for the NDP? Yeah, of course. Federally? Yeah. Why? Depends where. Okay, if they, if they, if they came <laughs> Would I run in Calgary Minifar? Probably not. <laughs> but if they came to you tomorrow and said, we want for you to run in Ottawa in the, which, let's be honest, it's going to be a minority government, probably in the 2020 or 2021 election, would you do it? Uh, hmm, probably not Ottawa. I don't know if I, 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 I wouldn't, no, because I don't know where I want to be right now. So I wouldn't run, I probably wouldn't run in the next election. <laughs> But uh, it seems like you were active as a, at a young age. Yeah. In so I, I joined the party at 16. But would you tell other young kids to get involved in politics? Yeah, I think it's important. Why? Uh, because it's important to have youth in politics. It's but it, they can't vote. If you're 16, you can't vote. Well, they could vote if they got if they started to organize. <laughs> True that. But so that's the thing. It's like if you want things to be changed, you have to organize. You have to get involved. And right now in our political system, you have to get involved with the party. And for me, that party had always been the NDP. And so that's why I'm still a member. That's why I still campaign with the NDP, whether that be in Ontario or out here in Alberta, because I'm passionate about workers' rights. I'm passionate about LGBTQ rights. I'm passionate about making sure that our economy works for everyone. What does the future hold for uh Alberta politics, Canadian politics, and the NDP, from your perspective. Oh, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> but you must, because you, must, you had a pulse on the electorate for four years. Mm-hmm. You were their representative in uh, Edmonton for four years. Yeah. You must know where this crazy country, uh, this province is going, or this crazy country of ours is going. Well, just as you, we, nobody can ever tell the future. No, but you you can assume that things are going to happen. And I know you should never assume because you make an ass out of you and me. Okay, understandable. But you should be able to look and say, okay, you know what? I see the trends right now and they're going the wrong way. Because we are a more divided country, more divided province than we ever have been. Are we? Really? You don't think so? No. I mean, we just think we're more divided now because we look back on, like, the 1960s. Oh, everything was perfect. No, people were still divided, but they were just less angry. No. I mean, when you look back to, like, 18, 1880 and the election in the United States, like, people were very divided. The Republican Party was incredibly divided. They had the stalwarts and the half-breeds. <laughs> and they were super mad at each other. They hated each other. And they would not vote. For, like, people who voted for John Sherman were not going to vote for uh, fucking <laughs> Ulysses S. Grant. And people... And that's why they ended up with James Garfield because it was a middle and like nobody was really happy with him and then he was assassinated and they got Ar- Arthur. <laughs> Just <Ray> Arthur. <laughs> Anyways, little history lesson. But then people were always, people have always been very divided. Like we, we're not going into a civil war. But we're more this openly isn't, divided now because I don't think in the 90s, like I, I don't remember it being this bad where people would like yell at you, scream at you, threaten you with violence. Really? You think that's the case? Well, I think they always had those feelings. They just didn't... Didn't always, have an outlet? They didn't, yeah. They didn't always say it. Do you think... Obviously, now with social media, somebody can, uh, like, threaten my life in an anonymous account, but they can do that in the early 90s, so... So, do you think social media has been bad for this country and bad for society? Ah, there, there are problems with it, and they need to be fixed, and that can be done through legislation to make it more equitable, but there's also, um, like, you have to... We have to have taxes on those types of things. We have to tax Netflix. We have to tax those types of things, or else we lose a lot of our uh, uh, 
uh, power over these things and soon like things like Netflix things like Facebook and Twitter will have more power and sometimes they do than governments uh, and that's a really big problem going into the future so I uh, asked this question then yeah why didn't you start something while you were in office uh, would be, well that's federal it's a federal jurisdiction well uh, <laughs> well Gay conversion therapy is a federal uh, jurisdiction, but you see municipalities. Well, you see municipalities doing it right now. Yeah. So why not? Why not start the conversation? Because you had the opportunity. Why not? Mm-hmm. Well, you, you can try as much as you can. Yeah, but you only have a certain amount of time. Yeah, and you only have a certain amount of power. I guess. And yeah, you can try to do as much as you can, but you're never going to please yourself. You're never going to please everybody else. So there's always things that you're going to want to do more. And there's always things that come up and you realize after the fact as well. Like, I, that was never something that was really high on my radar is trying to fix Facebook and Twitter <laughs> as, a, as, a back, as a backbench MLA and a provincial uh, uh, soft power. Um Looking back, looking forward, is there anything, even in your personal life, not just talking about your elected time, is there anything you would change to make you a better person to where you are now? Uh, I can always probably be a better person, but I don't know. <laughs> how, do, how do we make society a better place? How can we make society better? Uh, because that, that, that's where this, this, this whole podcast stems from, is I'm sick and tired of the 140-character tweet, the 280-character tweet. And don't get me wrong, I'm bad for it, too. I tweet, I Instagram, I yeah. social media all the time. But I'm trying to get back to the day when we would actually have a face-to-face conversation. Mm-hmm. And I don't see that happening anymore. Do you? We could use more Google Hangouts, I guess. What? <laughs> it's like a Skype. It's a- oh, my God. I feel so old. <laughs> That's what I use at work. <laughs> okay. I, I was taught all these things from people who are much older than me, and I feel very dumb. <laughs> I feel dumb now, too. Yeah. But do you not think that even getting away from social media for a week, two weeks, is beneficial to, A, our kids? I think we have to change the way that we use social media, but, like, there's not that much... I feel like all those com- all those messages that go out, well, let's say, like, if you're going to vote conservative, remove me as a friend, I don't think that's very helpful. <laughs> Like, I have friends who are conservative, I have friends who are liberal, I have friends who are green and blocked and everything. And I still really enjoy spending time with them. I send them messages when I think their party is doing well and I want to show my support for them as personally. Uh, and I think that's really important to, to show that we should have bipartisanship to a degree. We need to make sure that uh, we're supporting one another and that we uh, are all humans. Uh, however, we can still disagree on policy. And like, yeah, that's a big problem. I uh, The biggest problem i think with that is when policies uh attack personal uh attack people uh when you have a party that's saying gay people shouldn't exist when you have parties that's saying uh we should not take in immigrants i feel like that's uh it's, it's policy but it's a policy that really hurts people personally <laughs> So I feel like when people have a very uh, violent uh, feeling when people say that they shouldn't be in the country, I feel like those are genuine feelings that they should be able to uh, express. Will you voice your opinion if you... uh, I'm I'm bad for this, and I'll be the first to admit it. If we're at a gathering and I hear someone saying those type of things, that gay people shouldn't exist, immigrants shouldn't be here, I will be the one who doesn't say a thing. Mm -hmm. Because I I, I don't want to cause waves. I'm just going to be there. I'm keeping my head down. Will you actually openly say something to the person? Uh, I it's, it's it's iffy. Like if I feel empowered, if I've had like two drinks, then yes. Uh, if if I feel very nervous in that space already, if I am a polit, if I when I was a politician, it's very difficult because you don't want to alienate people. So there's some there's sometimes when you have to call things out and there's sometimes where you try to hold back. But now I don't have that uh, uh, filter, <laughs> not filter, but like uh, uh, felt though. I'm thinking French. Uh, <laughs> no worries. You've had two beers. So you're probably I've had one and a half. <laughs> OK, so uh, just the, the weight on you of being a politician and have to worry about that. Uh, I, I, I feel like I don't know if this is true or not, but I feel like I have been starting to call people out more whether that be on Facebook whether that be in person because it is something that's important and like it's not calling them out saying oh you're disgraceful it's like oh I'm sorry what did you say 
and getting to repeat it and then having a conversation about that well maybe you shouldn't use that word like I was I was at the I was on vacation at the lake with my family uh, and uh, a friend a family friend said something like oh uh, that's that's really gay I'm like oh well, what, what do you mean by that and he's like oh I just mean it's bad I'm like well well do you think you could use a different word <laughs> and yeah he's like oh well I didn't mean it that way I'm like I know you didn't mean it that way but you don't have to use that word that way it's a thing do you still I, mean, I know that's a one off issue yeah. in some sense but do you still get that because you're in university right now you're probably with some people who are younger and some people who are yeah. older do you still see that uh that use of that word as a derogatory meaning? No, really? very rarely. As I hear faggot more, but like gay, not so much. Like, like someone's oh, like, that's, oh, that's, that's so gay. that's so gay. That, like, no, I don't hear that. Really? Why? Well, I also hang, maybe hang out with too many gay people. <laughs> and when I say that's so gay, I mean like, oh, that's kind of homosexual. Uh, but <laughs> like, yeah, I don't know. And... Uh, yeah, we're we're almost we'll wrap we're it up here. Wrap it up here. Um, my last question is: Do you find and uh, this is this is why I can and this goes back to my very f- f- first or second question: Do you consider yourself a gay Canadian or Canadian who happens to be gay? Yeah. Do you find that there is a stigma within the gay community that if you're not active, if you're not openly pushing the cause, then you are not a proper gay? Because I find that, and I hear from. Some people who I will shall who shall remain nameless who are actively promoting the gay uh, cause and I don't want to say agenda because it's not an agenda. We don't get together. We don't Isn't make motions. I do. <laughs> okay, you might, but uh, <laughs> hearing depends that, on organization you're a member of. Exactly. I'm not members of any organization. So when I see that and I see people attacking me for not being so openly gay. It bothers me. Right. Do you think that still happens? Do you think that there is a subculture within the gay community that makes people think, you know what, if you're not out there banging on doors with wooden signs every time someone says something bad, you're a bad gay? Uh, I think, uh, yeah, I think that exists. But it, it, you, there has to be a happy medium. <laughs> like, yeah, there has, in order for lobbying and for in order for things to work properly, we have to have people on the steps of the legislature yelling and screaming. But we also have the people who are able to get in the legislature to push what we need to be the calm voices. Excuse me. Uh, to, to tell legis- who were able to talk to legislators and say well we need this done because of this 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 and this and sometimes we don't always get that win but sometimes we do and it is important that we have both of those sides and, some, and obviously not every gay person is going to be an activist and we, it's impossible to ask for that it's the same thing with any other community not everyone is going to be an activist not everybody wants to be an activist and that's fine uh, will you but be, you have to be will you respect. always be an activist? Uh, I think unfortunately <laughs> Really? Yeah, I, I love stirring the pot. <laughs> I can tell on your social media because every time something comes out from this government, the Alberta government, it seems that you've jumped right in. Oh, I, 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 I pay too much attention, and that's the problem. But like, uh, yeah, I, I really, I really enjoy being a part of things. I guess I really enjoy uh, being political. I really like uh, attacking. No. I don't say I like that. I I like getting things done, and I like people knowing that people are fighting for them. I, I, I unfortunately am not always on the front lines. I wouldn't call my maybe I am a militant gay, but I don't think I'm like <laughs> never heard that term in my life. Well, it's like a militant anything. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, but yeah, like if if I see some if I see something wrong, I will try to get the word out. I will try to push things. I will try to make a difference. And I feel like that's uh, kind of a problem in my current job, like to a degree. Like my job, I'm lucky that they'll they'll give me that leeway to fight within my uh, department to push things around. Uh, but I don't. But if I was in a different department, then I don't think I would have that ability. And even in my department, I get a little pushback. Uh, but yeah, I. Do you see a day when you won't have to be so active? No. Do you, do you think uh, uh, people will come to just finally accept it? Accept no. that two men love each other or two no. women love each other? Really? Everywhere? In Canada. No. Because really? we're, going to, we're always going to have homophobes. We're always going to have racists. 
but is waiting for that day where we don't have homophobes and racists running for office. Okay, and I get that. But even once we finish here, where are we going to go from there? Do we still have homophobes running in office in Colombia? Do we have homophobes running for office in Paraguay or uh, Ghana? Yeah, so we need to continue to fight to make sure that we're able and we are we have our rights around the world. But isn't that their fight? No. Why not? It's everyone's fight because Why? we're one community. I think that's the perfect place to stop. But thank you very much for doing this. I won't yeah, take no much time. You said seven o'clock, and it's four minutes to seven. I'm so, good. So we're, <laughs> we're good. Thank you very much, Michael, for doing this. Thanks. And one last time, thank you for our guest for coming in, sitting down with us. Much appreciate it. But I also want to take this moment and thank you, the listeners, for tuning in, for subscribing, and listening to our great podcast. Without your subscriptions and feedback, we wouldn't have the ability to continue on this great adventure. If you haven't already, head over to Facebook, give us a like. Cross Border Podcast. It's easy to find. Just type in Cross Border Podcast on that search bar or Twitter and Instagram, both Cross Border Podcast. And with that, I bid you adieu. We'll be back here next Saturday with another great edition of the Cross Border Interview Podcast. <laughs>